Well, hello there, internets. The holidays are upon us once again. A time to come together, snuggle up by the fireplace, put on a nice movie next to the ambient flickering of the Christmas lights and the smell of pine and hot chocolate and gingerbread. It's a time for togetherness. It's a time for family. It's a time for film. When I was growing up, uh, as a child, as one is when they're growing up, I remember, as many of you probably do who are around my age and came up in the 80s and 90s, I remember uh, sitting with my family and watching films. Just great movies. And some of them weren't great, but they were great, if you know what I mean. It was a time where we would go as a family to the uh, video rental store, Blockbuster, Hollywood Video, Mega Video, Movie Gallery, or the Mon Pa Shop with the five movies, five days, five dollar deal. We'd go and we'd spend an hour there, everybody walking around looking for what they're going to pick out, and sometimes it was uh, agreeing on one thing that we were going to watch together. Maybe we'd each get our own thing, but the point is, is that we weren't going home to streaming platforms with uh, infinity entertainment to turn to when our choices let us down. We would make these choices, we would go home, and this is what we had. This was our entertainment. This is what we spent our time and money on. This is what we are now committed to. So good or bad, this is we're going to watch this from opening credits to closing credits. And we're probably going to watch it multiple times, good or bad. It's all we have. We we don't have Netflix. We don't have Hulu. We don't have YouTube. We have the 25 random VHS tapes that we keep in our collection and we watch. There are our go-tos. And we've got these handful of movies for two days from Blockbuster. And they, these are the new stuff. We spent... Three, four dollars on each one of these things. We've got them for two days. This is our entertainment. We committed to it. And because of this environment, it created these opportunities to find and fall in love, good or bad, with with movies that I still love to this day that still hold a very special place in my heart that had some kind of small part in shaping who I became as a person, my personality, my sense of humor, my views on the world, all of these things based on walking around the video store with your family and picking out something most of the time because it had a cool cover, you know, barely, I don't remember reading the backs of those things. And that that's how, that's how some of the, my favorite movies were found. And I feel like that is a, uh, that is something that we've lost today. Sadly, there could be plenty of advantages that that could be said in favor of what we now have that has replaced those experiences we you know it's it's awesome that you have anything you want to watch at any time for the most part you can find it you can't deny how awesome that is but it also has taken away something that was pretty awesome from us and and that was just the ability to commit to something that you weren't 100 percent sure what it was and you just watched it from beginning to end. Anyway, so I have been thinking about that a lot lately, and uh, I have a daughter. Uh, Her name is Adeline. She is eight years old, and in our house, we have just kind of started consuming entertainment independently. Uh, It's a very private experience. It's not communal. It's not a family thing. I've got my YouTube. My daughter has her uh, 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 Disney Plus shows that she goes to, or Wednesday, or she's getting into anime. My wife has Hulu that she goes to to uh, consume her 90s sitcoms. So we all have these different worlds that we live in as far as entertainment is concerned. And I feel like we're missing out on some of the the best moments because that when I look back at my childhood, 
that is just some of the best memories that I have are those moments where you you don't you just sit with people you care about and you enjoy something together and you don't have to be burdened with having to talk or listen to somebody you're just all enjoying this thing together and when it's over you have this thing that you share and there is something special and just so simple about that and I kind of want to get that back so in my house we have decided to uh on Sundays, start having a family movie night and just commit to it from we, we pick a movie, we watch it beginning to end, we just commit to it. Phones away, ignore the fact that there's a million other options that, that are begging for our attention and just enjoy this movie like it's 1989. The way that we are going to do this is uh, there's like four weeks in a month most of the time. And, uh, you know, one Sunday I'll pick. The next Sunday my wife will pick. Sunday after that we'll let Adeline pick. And then the fourth Sunday will be a, a group decision. So I made a list of, of movies that I plan to show Adeline on my nights. And I figured I'd share that with you. So this is my list of 20 films that I think every parent should show show their children. And it starts with Flight of the Navigator. I, I'm not a big fan of Disney. And I don't know, Disney really didn't make this. They just kind of distributed it. But anyway, this movie was just, it, it left a mark on me. Like most family films, uh, it seems like they kind of cater to the lowest common denominator and try and treat kids like they're, like they're just dumb or they can't get innuendo or satire, or if something is a little dark or edgy, it might turn them off. Like they don't have the brain capacity to, to understand that things and feelings might be three dimensional. Flight of the Navigator is in no way like that. It, it has this ominous tone to it that you don't really get in uh, movies that are suitable for children. You get the voice of Pee Wee Herman as the spaceship. And what, what really stood out to me about Flight of the Navigator is that it really captured that feeling of loneliness um, and especially feeling homesick. The, as a child, the, the way you feel lonely and homesick as a child, it captured that almost too well. It, it's, it's uncomfortable in a good way at times. But I feel like most family films and films that are suitable for children kind of bask in this like nonstop joy. And it just sets this unrealistic uh, expectation for what life is going to be. And it probably makes a lot of kids look at their own life and think, why... Am I not always giddy, giddy, happy, happy, like I see all the kids in all the movies that I watch? Uh, what's wrong with my life? I, I, so I really like movies like Flight of the Navigator. They aren't afraid to go to those, explore those dark places and feelings that we all have. Uh, but for some reason, um, most family films like to ignore. On that same note, as far as like uh, kids in peril, uh, another film is Never Ending Story. It's a classic. It's an adventure. It encourages reading, which is always great when a movie can encourage reading. Because it really, it really makes you believe that if you... Like to see the, to see the way they make the book come to life for the kid that's reading it, it makes you believe that, you know, any rightfully so makes you believe that any book is kind of a uh, doorway for you to go and experience anything within your own mind. Um, that's a really cool concept. And not to mention just never ending story is such a classic. It's, uh, and it's another one of those films that isn't afraid to go to the darker places and explore the darker themes. And I just feel like that's important for, uh, for kids to experience at least somebody experiencing those kinds of challenges just so they know that they're not alone in those feelings this one might be a little controversial uh i don't know it's i think it's pg-13 it's called the gate it's a it's a old old god 1980s uh horror film about some kids that dig a hole in the backyard and end up uh 
accidentally opening up the gates of hell their parents go away for a weekend and you know hell wreaks havoc on the house in the form of uh demons and other kind of strange monsters but it's uh it's not overly graphic it's it's um it's centered around kids and i feel like it's just it's the perfect uh gateway pun intended uh film for uh if you're wanting if you're like a big horror fan um that that wants to get your kid into horror i it's weird when i was growing up as a child six seven eight nine i'm watching people get slashed and hacked and uh night freddy krueger was my idol uh, uh the howling it is it is just a very different time now and i guess we have to just live with that because it is what it is but for some reason kids seem a lot more sensitive now to things that we just kind of watched and it just didn't have the same kind of impact so uh, understanding that i am creating this list in today's climate you know i want i want to honor the films of the past and keep them alive for new generations but also i don't want to scar any kids that uh you know, we just have to operate in the times that we're living in so that there will be a time and place for the, the hardcore horror films that we grew up on. Um, they just might have to come a little bit later for our kids. And the gate is a perfect gateway into that world of fantasy and horror. All right. This one's going to be a quick one because there has already been so much said about it. Back to the Future. Steven Spielberg, Michael J. Fox, Christopher Lloyd. This list would not be complete without me telling you to make sure that your kids have seen Back to the Future. It's a classic film. It's shot perfectly. Uh, it's imaginative. It's And Steven Spielberg just has, especially in that time, just had a way of it's just the definition of movie magic to just create this world and feeling when you're watching it that you can get swept into and he can just make you believe anything that a DeLorean could travel through time and that a, a man could almost date his mom and end up hooking her up with who would become his dad. It's all believable. It doesn't sound believable. I'm not Steven Spielberg. I can't make it compelling but back to the future is an iconic film that your kids should see the goonies the goonies i mean it's it encourages you to go outside uh, you probably should stay out of the sewer system but it encourages the kids to go outside have an adventure be a little bit risky uh and it's just another classic it's another one of those films that is not afraid to go into those darker places have a sense of humor that they um that they respect the kids enough to believe that they'll be able to appreciate uh, the Goonies. Corey Feldman, come on. Another one kind of in the same vein as the Goonies, doesn't get nearly as much love, I think, because of the Goonies. Uh, seems to be like a Star Trek, Star Wars divide situation happening there. You can love both. I just want to give you permission right now. You're allowed to love both. And the other one is the Monster Squad. The Monster Squad was personally my favorite above the Goonies. I like I I grew up on them both. I loved them both. Monster Squad was always one that I uh, identified more with. It it just resonated a little bit more with me because I was that kid that uh, just idolized these creatures from horror films. Uh, I was that kid. I, I was I, I, I was all those kids. Uh, I, I was the Monster Squad. I wanted to, that. That was me. That was me. But the Monster Squad is just another one of those great movies. It's just fun. It's an adventure. You get uh, it's a it's kind of it's kind of like a gateway into horror films because you get a nice introduction to the classic horror icons um, in a very non-threatening kind of way. There's just a little bit of uh, the possibility of peril happening. Um, but I think you have this general feeling that everything is going to be all right throughout it so that that keeps like a, a a blanket of protection over your feelings when you're watching it so you can enjoy the the fun there's it's it's shot shane black uh wrote it and he he did the lethal weapons as well as kiss kiss bang bang uh and so many other great films but the 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 signature to his writing is just very witty super quick uh hilarious dialogue and you see it in Lethal Weapon, um, Robert Downey Jr. and Val Kilmer tear it apart in Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. And it's no different in the Monster Squad with this cast of leading children 
uh, they're carrying the weight of this dialogue that Shane, uh, Shane Black has written just as well as anybody else. And it works so well. Like it's really the heart of the film is watching these kids that the kids banter uh, back and forth. Just a classic film. And it just encourages kids to have like a, a little bite to their personality, which I think is never a bad thing. The Labyrinth, Jim Henson, David Bowie, Jennifer Connelly for the dads. What are you going to say? Yeah, she was. All right. Maybe not for the dad. It's dicey. She's of age now. I don't know how old she was at that time. I was underage when I... Anyway, The Labyrinth. It's it's Jim Henson. It's David Bowie. It's a great soundtrack. Um, Jim Henson always puts these messages in his films and shows that is, is just so easy to stand behind. Peace, love, harmony, acceptance. And uh, yeah, The Labyrinth. All right. And another Jim Henson film, Follow That Bird. I grew up on Sesame Street. I'm sure many of you did as well. Um, it's a staple of our society, thankfully. It's one of the one of the good things that we have that have always been there that have it just seems not to have been adulterated over time. Follow That Bird is a feature film that Sesame Street put out all about Big Bird. Uh trying to find his real family of birds and realizing that his real family all along was this eccentric group of, uh, of people on Sesame Street, people in puppets, Muppets. So that's, that's Follow That Bird, but it's an awesome musical. Waylon Jennings and Big Bird do a uh, duet together in it, which, I mean, right there I could stop. And it's just, it's another one of those movies that's just fun. It's an adventure. It's kind of like a Wizard of Oz situation. It's a fish out of water situation. It's uh, and all of the classic Sesame Street characters are in it in full effect. Um, you get some uh, comedians and cameos from uh, stars at the time. Some of them still stars now. Pretty sure Steve Martin makes an appearance in it. But yeah, it is a it is a great film, great musical, funny, like sincerely funny. Uh, very heartfelt at times. Um, it, it, it's be open with your feelings and all that good stuff. Follow that bird. You'll, you'll be happy you did. Short Circuit. Short Circuit is the reason why I, in fourth grade, spent three weeks trying to make a robot out of a kid's Canon copier. A kid's Canon copier was something that you could buy at Toys R Us that was just like a regular scanner. You could put your picture in it, close it, scans it. I don't remember what happened to it from there, but the point is it was a scanner. It went like this. So I was able to lift one part up, put another part on there like this. So it would make like a triangular shape. I put a face on that. I had a, a tape recorder inside of the triangle that I could speak in a microphone to to make it work. I put wheels on it, uh, made it very like it gave it humanoid features on on its face and and closed it and uh brought it into school as show and tell and it was it was robbie the robot it was the star uh of the day it was a whole big thing because it was so big that my mom had to come into school with me and help me bring it in and all the kids wanted to hear their voice come out of it so everybody was on the microphone and uh, Robbie was a star, and uh, I was king for a day in Moore's Avenue, uh, Miss Knowlton's class. I was king for a day, and that was thanks to Short Circuit, because as a kid, watching Short Circuit, it sparked this thing in me, like, oh my god, I can make a robot. And, uh, I mean, I don't really have a way to expand on that as an adult. It was just, as a kid, it just opened up this thing door in my mind that was previously closed that um that we can engineer things uh we can make a friend <laughs> it was uh it was it was just a really it was just a really cool experience and another movie that is uh it's funny it's for adults i i think i'm pretty sure it's it's more of an adult film but I mean, you got a, a six foot talking robot through the whole thing, so you and your kids can enjoy it. I didn't get half the humor the first time I saw it, but it was just so cool seeing Johnny number five. So, yeah, short circuit. All right, big, big Tom Hanks at the, I don't know, is that the height of his? No, definitely not the height. I was at Forrest Gump, Philadelphia. 
This is probably the climb. Poor Tom Hanks at the climb of his career. It's such a fun movie, though, and it has a good message. A great message that kids can't hear enough. And it doesn't matter how many adults tell you to enjoy this time right now while you have it. Enjoy being a kid. Being an adult sucks. You'll want to be a kid again, trust me. And it doesn't matter how many times... We tell kids that it doesn't matter how many times we were told that as kids. We all just want to grow up for some reason. And this movie serves as a kind as a nice reminder that uh that you will want that that growing up does kind of suck. Although you know I, I... As a kid, when I watched it, I just remember thinking how freaking sweet it would be to be able to have my own gymnasium size loft with the trampoline and bunk beds and arcade games. I mean, they did make being an adult seem pretty... It was an unrealistic representation of what being an adult... This guy got like an executive position... This guy, this boy in a man's body got like an executive position and enough money to buy a whole floor of an apartment it seemed like in what was it new york it was a big city i'm gonna say new york probably new york and then just stack it with arcade okay all right so big is a really fun movie it doesn't necessarily do a go- good job at proving the point of being an adult sucks and that you shouldn't grow up but it does open up the ability to have that conversation with your kids in a in a way that's fun um, at the end of the day, he does end up going back to being a kid. That is what he, he wants to be back home. He wants his mom. He, he just wants it to be like the way it was. So uh, they get there at the end, but man, do they, they really romance the hell out of being an adult. Huh? I, I, I stand by it though. Big is fun. Big is very fun. Gremlins. I watched this one with my daughter when she was very little. Uh, she loved Gizmo. We got her a gizmo, uh, a, a mogwai, for uh, her birthday. It, it was it was a cool experience, but I, I think that she has long forgotten Gremlins. Um, she probably remembers Gizmo, but I don't think she has any recollection of the movie. She was way too young, I, I believe. Uh, so that's on the list to rewatch, and I think it's a movie that you should watch with your kids. It's another kind of tiptoeing into the horror genre uh, from a very safe distance it's just a really fun movie that puts you in a world where you believe that there could be this little cute little thing that exists and and you really want one even after everything goes bad they do such a good job of making it so cute that you still want one it's a steven spielberg production so you know you're getting a certain kind of quality and you know you're just going to be swept into this world that you can escape into for 90 minutes or for however long Uh, it's classic cinema and it happens to have a cute little mogwai running around making little squeaky noises that will make your kids enjoy it enough to sit through the other stuff that will shape them into better human beings somehow i don't know beetlejuice with Beetlejuice 2 right around the corner, what better time to show your kids Beetlejuice? Not not only is it tiptoeing into the horror genre, but it's also a nice introduction to dark comedy, which I think family films should embrace more of. Uh, dark comedy, especially in the society we live in, in the world we live in, and all of the craziness that exists, I feel like dark comedy is the best coping mechanism that you can equip somebody with to survive the worst day. Uh, If you can figure out a way to laugh at things that you shouldn't necessarily laugh at, um, that could be a very powerful tool to have when uh, unfunny things are happening to you. Movies like Beetlejuice that introduce uh, you to that kind of outlet um, of, of laughing at uh more like morbid humor uh it's a good thing as weird as that sounds it is a good thing it's necessary it's a necessary thing to it's necessary not to mention michael keaton michael keaton is absolutely amazing in that movie it was probably 
it was way too long after I saw Beetlejuice and Batman before I realized that they were the same person. That's how good Michael Keaton is. Or that's how bad at facial recognition I am. I don't know, but I stand by. I think Michael Keaton is amazing, and I don't care who disagrees with me. Michael Keaton is a national treasure. Michael Keaton for president. And yet another one that kind of tiptoes your toddler right into the horror genre where we want them. Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. Not two, but one. Two is fun, but one will get it done. Ghostbusters is a classic. Ghostbusters will introduce your kid to Bill Murray, which I know in today's climate and stories that are surfacing, Bill Murray is maybe, potentially, probably a problematic man. I don't know. I don't know. But all I know is that growing up and through most of my adolescent and young adulthood, there was a place in my heart that Bill Murray held and still holds to this day dearly because he just has a certain charm about him. He has a certain wit and the way he just kind of brushes stuff off his shoulder like nothing bothers him is something that I aspire to emulate in my daily life because I just feel like it makes you untouchable and God, it'd be great to be untouchable. Anyway, I digress. Ghostbusters is fantastic. I mean, it's Dan Aykroyd. It's Harold Ramis. It's Bill Murray. Uh, you don't get a lot of uh, Slimer in Ghostbusters. Uh, I was always, I always felt let down by that as a kid because I saw the cartoon first. Either way, it's imaginative. I think the score really helps, um, like bring out. Uh, a more playful feeling when horrific things are happening. Uh, it's more like a magical thing when the score is applied. And I think that that helps to like keep the kids safe in the darker moments. And it's just another film that one, it introduces them to dark comedy and introduces them to uh, the possibility of peril. Um, and uh, it's, it's a friendship film. It's a friendship film. Okay, this one is very special to me. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. This movie is probably more so responsible than any other film in crafting who I am today. Uh, there was something about Ferris. I think I was like eight, nine years old the first time I saw Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And it just immediately spoke to me. Uh, and I'm probably like one in a million boys of that age that wanted to be Ferris, that wanted that leopard skin vest with the white and black and gray patchwork leather jacket and the cool gray dress pants singing shake it a baby while the whole city cheers you on. Of course we all wanted to be that, but on a deeper level, just the contrarian, the see what you can get away with, the toe the line, the find the gray area, those little things about Ferris's personality um, was very, uh, it was it just, it was very attractive to me. And uh, the film itself is just really cool because it lets it's it lets you in on all of his thoughts he's always talking to you directly which i think is a cool experience for kids and helps to you know ver it helps to encourage you to verbalize your thoughts and feelings and and also he does it in a super articulate way which is always a good thing to uh encourage uh encourage articulation i don't care who stands against it? I stand by articulation. Uh, Ferris Bueller was witty. Uh, Cameron was also uh, just, you know, the part in where he is jumping up and down outside his car is just classic. And, and I just also, I just feel like it's important to, uh, the world needs rebels. Uh, the world needs rule breakers. Uh, the world needs people who look at something uh, and and say that oh, yeah 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 I know that's the way you said it should be done but eh, what about this way it, we need those people and uh, movies like Ferris Bueller's Day Off I think watching at a young age helps foster uh, those kinds of um, qualities in people and children as they grow up to be adults free thinkers risk takers rule breakers.
Biscuit Shaker. I don't know. E.T. Steven Spielberg. What can I say? It's another film that also it just kind of. It's it's it's. <laughs> It's definitely dark. Yeah, it's definitely dark. So especially in the third act, it gets super dark. But it's it's just such a good film. I, it's the same thing I said about every other Steven Spielberg film of that era. It just... It's movie magic. It's movie magic, love. It sweeps you right up. It takes you into this world, like it or not. If you just give it a few minutes of your attention, if you just give it the opportunity, it will grab you by the hand and pull you into this place where an alien really can end up in your shed and become your friend. And and it is just a uh, really cool film. It's a film that you should see. That's why it's on this list. Princess Bride. Princess Bride is not personally a film that I grew up on as a kid. Honestly, it's on this list because I know my wife will punch me or strike me in some kind of way if it were not on this list. Do I love The Princess Bride? Yes. Do I think it's hilarious? Yes. Do I think uh, Tate Donovan? Why does that name not sound right to me in this moment? Carrie Elwes? Do I think Carrie Elwes is uh magnificent in that film absolutely uh my name is Antigo you killed my father you prepare yeah it's all the uh, mowage it's all it's it's it is a it's a good film it's a very good film and I enjoy it and I think uh kids would enjoy it I just didn't see it as a kid um so I, I want to be honest about that I want to be totally transparent about the fact that I never saw The Princess Bride as a child. I saw it as an adult, and I enjoyed it as an adult. Princess Bride. It's for adults and for children. All right, this next one is Just in Time for the Holidays. It is a classic. You've probably seen it. Even just on accident, flipping through the channels. Do people still flip through channels? A Christmas Story. A Christmas Story is a classic. It's the perfect Christmas movie. It puts you right in the holiday spirit. It's really crazy because it's like a, it's a vision of the 50s told through the lens of the 80s. So watching it in the 2020s is kind of like a experience. But uh, it still holds up because at the heart of it, it's family. It's dealing with bullies. It's... Uh, it's really like wanting something that you can't have. It's all these feelings that really are relevant at any time, not just of year, but uh, any decade. It's these just human things that we go through that don't really change. And I think that, at least for me, watching it in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, and now, looking back on it, uh, you get all of these human experiences that you can identify with. But... At the same time, it's kind of existing in this world that is, for lack of a better word, kind of exotic to people who have no frame of reference of a, a phone with a cord on it or listening to a radio show to, to find out a secret code to win something. It's like all these little details in it um, that we, uh, or especially kids, have very little frame of reference for just kind of makes... It, I feel like uh, it adds to the charm of it because at this point, it's practically a fantasy film. Real emotions existing in a fantasy world. None of, none of these things in A Christmas Story uh, exist anymore. But yeah, A Christmas Story is a classic. It is an iconic film and it has important messages to convey and a lot of heart. And it's just a perfect way to get into the family spirit. So if you're doing family movie night in December and somehow have never seen A Christmas Story... Uh, put this on your list for Christmas. Okay, Ernest Goes to Camp. I loved Ernest P. Worrell. 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 Ugh. I love Ernest. All the movies. I think my favorite Ernest film uh, was probably Ernest Saves Christmas. But Ernest Goes to Camp was the original. It was the introduction. I mean, watch all the Ernest movies, but definitely start with Ernest Goes to Camp. It is just Ernest is just such a great character, and and from everything that I've uh, once with the uh, invention of the internet and all the information that comes with that to ruin our childhood heroes, it only seems like it has 
serve to boast the legacy of Jim Varney, who played Ernest as just being a downright um, great human being, which makes me love Ernest even more. He's simple. He's goofy. I think the thing that I like most about Ernest and the movies in general is that there's no... Like, don't get me wrong, I love cynicism, and there is a time and place for it most of the time, most of the places, but I do enjoy having these little corners that I can go to, like Ernest Goes to Camp, where there's no cynicism, it's just innocent, good-hearted, simple, fun comedy, and and I, I don't know, I just, I feel like it's a safe, um, I feel like it's a very safe recommendation for me to make to tell you to get your kids into earnest because uh one i don't want um the legacy of earnest to be forgotten with future generations i would love for the earnest films to live on and on not be remade not be rebooted but those same earnest films that i watched with jim varney that still hold up because he was just an amazing character actor with a, like a ball of of eclectic energy uh those should live on and and i just feel like he had a certain quality to him that could still hold the attention and uh and or, or earn the attention of kids today the same way it did when i was a kid there was just i felt like I felt like he was more on my level as a kid than he was on the adults in the room. Like he was, he was my bud. Um, so yeah, check out Ernest Goes to Camp, and if you've never seen any of the Ernest films, watch. I mean, they they do kind of yeah, kind of take a dive in quality towards the later ones, but it's all Ernest, and it's all yeah, he's just always enjoyable to watch. But Ernest Goes to Camp and Ernest Saves Christmas probably the best two. Okay, so that is 18 films that you as a parent should be watching with your kids. The last two on this list of 20, I'm going to put a disclaimer on. I kids they're rated R. You it literally under 17 you should not be watching them. But I watched them when I was little. I'm okay for the most part. I feel like they have important messages to convey uh or at the very least they're harmless um for the most part so i i say i i give these last two suggestions with that disclaimer that this these two are definitely not for most kids you know your kids better than anybody else you know if they can handle the content the uh the themes that are at play in these last two uh you know if they are in a place ma uh, maturity wise or just in their lives where uh, they can, this won't have a negative effect on them. Okay, so with that said, the last two, the first one of the last two, number 19, is A Breakfast Club. I recognize that A Breakfast Club has not necessarily aged that well in some of the humor that is, that's in it, kind of making light of like, uh, uh, our word or, or APE and, or, you know, uh, consent stuff like that it, it does kind of uh toe the line on a few of the but at the same time it was just kind of the language and the way things were uh so it's it's uh, he can't really fault it for being a reflection of the characters that it was trying to convey with that said though um it, I just think it's a really, that film has always stuck with me. I saw it before I was in high school. And when I got to high school, it that film stuck with me, uh, just not excluding people and, and not embracing click culture uh, and just really kind of being open-minded about about who I would befriend. And I, I owe probably most of that way of thinking to watching The Breakfast Club as a young age and seeing these uh, very different teenagers uh, spend a day in detention, a Saturday detention together. And the whole thing practically takes place in one room in the library where they're all at. And it's just them hashing it out, getting real, like there's there's some of the most iconic hilarious moments in that movie with judd nelson i mean all of them judd nelson is the as the slacker and emilio estevez as the jock and um uh anthony michael hall as the uh nerd 
and uh, Molly Ringwald as the uh, the queen and Ali Sheedy as the as kind of like the goth girl outcast. They all like have their moments in it that that stand out that are like quotable and memorable. Uh, but then they also all have these moments of like real uh, sincerity and uh, it just goes up and down from a laugh out loud comedy to uh, to a very serious, like overly dramatic almost uh, drama. And and I just think it, it's, it does a really good job at conveying that even though we all look different and we have different preferences and uh, we're into different things, at the end of the day, we're all united by like the same fears and the same aspirations to a degree. Like we all want to live. We all want to be accepted. We don't want to be outcast. Uh, we, we have these, we have these very similar fears at the core of us that could connect us instead of allowing it to tear us apart. And that's kind of like the underall message of the breakfast club. And do they use a whole lot of potty humor and kind of questionably, um, moral, uh, qu morally questionable, uh acts that kind of transpire here and there yes but uh, have a conversation with your kids when you're watching it this is wrong that's simple what he did that was wrong people did that at that time it, it's happened a lot less whatever it, it open it, just because a movie is doing something doesn't mean the whole movie's bad doesn't mean the messaging in the movie is bad it just it means that you have now have an opportunity to discuss something about why something's wrong with your kids so yeah the breakfast club john hughes i mean he had his pulse on the he had his finger on the pulse of the youth i think he was actually i don't know Paul, john john hughes was just he was the nostradamus of children okay and the last one on my list and again not something that is for kids by any means it's something that i enjoyed as a kid i dressed up as as him for i think it was like second or third grade uh nightmare on elm street i mean this movie is bloody it's terrifying it's scar i've had one nightmare in my life and it was of freddy krueger but i feel like it's a very i don't think fear or being afraid is an unhealthy thing and i think horror films is a really great place to understand that that there's something that you can take from fear, especially when it's in a safe place, like just a fictional film. And especially a fictional film like Nightmare on Elm Street that specifically limits that fear to like, look, this is, this is, it's a nightmare. And that's something that you can kind of wrap your head around even as a kid is that, you know, we're all afraid to go to sleep. What's going to happen when we go to sleep? But the other thing about Nightmare on Elm Street is that it shows the main character overcome those fears and realize that this is just a dream and that she does have the power. And it, it, she just, if she, and what, what ends up defeating Freddy at the end of the day is that she is just not afraid of him. And that's the message that we try to convey to our kids anyway, when they're afraid of something. It's like, if you're, you, the only thing that's given this thing power is your imagination is your, you being afraid of it, of it. You take all the power away when, uh, you stop being afraid. And that's, you can't argue with the fact that that's a good message for kids to hear. Now, it's up to you as a parent to decipher whether or not, you know, all of the blood and horror and suspense that A Nightmare on Elm Street takes to get there um, is something that your kid can handle. But if they can, I think that it is a great film. And uh, Freddy Krueger, this is another one of those films that is not so much like... I mean, Freddy Krueger was was funny, and once they get into Freddy Krueger, not so much in the first one. He kind of don't the, the humor didn't really come out so much in the first one, but if they get into Freddy Krueger and you go down the Nightmare on Elm Street series, he gets funnier and funnier and funnier, and by the end of it, he's more of just kind of like a Mickey Mouse that kills you. So there's that that aspect of it too. I think I just for me as a kid when I watch Nightmare on Elm Street, I just got such a kick out of Freddy Krueger. I, I, he scared me for sure. And I was scared of him, but it was just this, it was just this weird relationship where it's like, I'm scared of you, but you are so cool and hilarious. I know you really can't hurt me. 
you're not really a threat to me. A Nightmare on Elm Street is probably the horror film that, that kind of encapsulated my whole childhood. Um, so I just feel like it had to be on that list. And if you think that it's something that your kid can handle, I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, kids finding out about Freddy Krueger and also how to effectively face their fears at an early age. Um, yeah. So that is my list of 20 films, 18 plus two films that I think you should watch with your kids. They're, they are films that I will be watching with my kids. I will say uh, Nightmare on Elm Street for me personally, like with my daughter, that's going to come way later. I would love to watch that with her right now tonight. I would love nothing more than to get my daughter into Freddy Krueger. She has even uh, b -b 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 hit it with the light. <laughs> She knows that I'm into Freddy, so she, you know, she she's an excellent artist. She drew me this Freddy, so she supports my love for Freddy. Um, I and she's getting into spooky things, but she is just uh, uh just seems very sensitive to uh horrific things that you find in her around Elm Street. So, um, it's definitely not for all kids. It's not for my daughter. Might not be for your kids. But if you feel like your kid is up to it, uh, can handle it, uh, get them into a Nightmare on Elm Street as early as you possibly can. All right. So uh, again, that is the list. 18 plus two films that I think you should show your kids. Please let me know in the comments which ones that you have seen. If you end up uh, watching any of these with your kids, I'd love to know what uh, you thought about it, what your kids' reactions to it were. Um, I'll try to update the comments in here as well as we go through our movie nights, and uh, we'll see what happens. Let's get back together as a family and watch TV. Peace. Happy holidays. Hollywood video.